Hi, everyone. Um, so I will t uh, tell you about um, our new set of simulations, uh, which we call the Elastra simulations, which we are running in the um, in uh, Lars Rehnquist's group at the CFA, uh, with a bunch of um, postdocs and students listed here, and also with uh, in close collaboration with Volker Springel at Heidelberg. So I'm going to start with a very brief introduction. So we have maybe two major problems when we come to um, model galaxy formation. One is that the processes that we can relatively reliably model, which are gravity and uh, radiative cooling, are ones that give us uh, very unrealistic galaxies. So it's uh, shown here, basically both of these plots are uh, plots of stellar mass versus halo mass. What we see here is the uh, baryon, uh, the cosmic baryon fraction. And this uh, gray line shows the stellar mass over halo mass, which we obtain from simulations with no feedback, so only radiative cooling, uh, as opposed to the observations that lie around this region where the black line. So we get much too massive galaxies. The same thing is shown here from the Aquila comparison project, where we see a bunch of different codes with different um, physical modeling and also different numerical approaches. And we see that both of these things affect uh, the results. So most of this scatter is from uh, different uh, physical modeling. But uh, these two dots here, Ramses and Arepo uh, versus Gadget, have the same, uh, the same physics exactly. So it's only the numerical code that also creates very large differences in the stellar mass we form. The other problem we have is, of course, the com computational challenge. So here, um, putting just very, very basic requirements uh, to resolve galaxies, let's say we need to resolve at least one KPC. That's really not so good, but uh, if you're doing worse than that, you're really not resolving a galaxy. Uh, at the same time, to resolve, uh, to get statistical samples of galaxies and to resolve various um, uh, environments of the universe, you need to model at least uh, on scales of 100 megaparsec or so. Now, these two requirements uh, combined, um, you can really do with the standard number of resolution elements that people can run, can run with computer, uh, current computers um, reasonably. So we need, uh, you need many more resolution elements than that, and that is uh, computationally very expensive. So we tried uh, in the illustrious simulations to um, um, do some compromise. So we simulate a volume of 75 megaparsec cube um, with a repo code, which is a moving mesh uh, hydro solver. So uh, I'll get to the resolution in a moment, but choosing this uh, 75 megaparsec cube volume gives us at redshift zero uh, around 10 halos more massive than 10 to the 14, so we get to the cluster regime. And a very uh, nice statistical sample of around 1,000 Milky Way-like uh, galaxies. Now, to obtain this um, 1 kpc resolution, we need to go to a very large number, uh, very large simulation. So we use uh, 1820 cubed um, resolution elements. So you can think of this as, uh, as roughly a Millennium 2 simulation. It's a bit smaller in volume, a bit higher in res uh, resolution, but it's full hydrodynamics. So we start to resolve halos of about 2 times 10 to the 8 solar masses. Our uh, baryonic resolution is about 10 to the 6 solar masses and um, spatial um, softening, as I said, half or one kpc. Uh, we have lower resolution versions which are already done, and the big, um, the big run, the full physics run, is currently running for a few months now, and will be finished in a few weeks. So the results I'm going to show you are based on uh, some are based on smaller test boxes, and some are on the lower resolution versions of this run. So which physics did we use in these runs? Uh, more or less standard, but tr we try to be comprehensive. So we have star formation and stellar evolution, so mass return from stars, metal enrichment, metal line cooling. Uh, we have uh, black hole growth, uh, feedback from, from black holes, uh, including some um, radiation, uh, some uh, AGN proximity effects. Very importantly, we have uh, galactic winds, a uh, very simple prescription for galactic winds, which have been, has been used for about 10 years now. And uh, as I said, black hole growth and feedback. So uh, a very rough, uh, to give you a rough feeling for what the feedback does. So this is uh, the deep field, the Hubble, Hubble deep field. And this is uh, an emulation of the Hubble deep field from old simulations, which include no feedback, no stellar uh, modeling, just radiative cooling and star formation. You see um, these don't really look the same. We have too many galaxies. This is the overcooling problem. When we add to this uh, metaline cooling and stellar uh, and mass return from stars, we get even more 
even more galaxies and they're even bluer because there's more gas uh, returned from stars to, and more metal cooling to give even more star formation. When we add supernova feedback that reduces significantly the number of low mass galaxies but you see they are still bluer than the, the real universe. And when we add the AGN feedback, we get a universe which looks much better uh, compared to the real one. So a bit more quantitatively, we use uh, these three um, measurements or uh, quantities to constrain our model. Obviously, we have some free parameters in all of these feedback or physical models. We have around 10 or maybe 15, depends, depends on how you count. Free parameters, which are physically motivated, but there is some freedom. Uh, so on the left panels, uh, you see the, our fiducial model at different resolutions. On the right panels, uh, our fiducial model with variations uh, of a factor of two around some uh, parameters. So we constrain those parameters to match the cosmic star formation history, the stellar mass over halo mass relation that we seen before in the mass metallicity relation at redshift zero and then we run the simulation and uh, we hope that we get other things right and uh, things at higher redshift also right and of course we hope to learn from the things we don't get right. So some of the, th the things we get reasonably right is the tally fisher relation, uh, the stellar mass function, uh, black hole uh, stellar mass relation and the star formation rate marine sequence al although there is some uh, still some tension here our star formation rates per given stellar mass are still a bit too low, uh, similarly to what other hydrodynamic simulations find. Then at high redshift, um, we, uh, what I show here is the so-called the Moster plot, the uh, stellar mass normalized to the halo mass as a function of the halo mass. So this is at, at low redshift, which we constrained for, and this is at high redshift. So it's roughly similar, but still evolves, and uh, seems, seems to, uh, we have a reasonable agreement, although we still even with the feedback we use, which is quite extreme, we still uh, possibly overproduce stars, although we he heard yesterday and also a little bit today about the uncertainties in the measurements of, of stellar masses. So I think this is reasonably okay. Uh, gas fractions we, we've seen today from, uh, from Linda. So uh, we've seen this plot from Linda and um, what we get here is uh, from redshift two, uh, the top curve to redshift zero. So it's largely similar, I would say, maybe, maybe the uh, uh, trend with mass is a bit stronger. Uh, this is due to the uh, very high mass loading factors uh, that we have at low stellar masses, so they keep the galaxies uh, very, very gas rich, but generally we get the, the gas masses okay. Then uh, galaxy size evolution, so we see SDSS galaxies, uh, sorry there are no labels, this is uh, log of the size in kiloparsecs and stellar log of the stellar mass in stellar masses, uh, and the high redshift. So the size mass relation, and this is uh, what we get in our simulation. So uh, this is still a bit, this is preliminary. Uh, we don't really measure the sizes here and in the same way as the, in, in the observations, but generally you can see we get uh, the size evolution. Uh, what's interesting, you can add onto this plot, you can color uh, this plane by specific star formation rate, and Williams uh, et al. in 2010 showed this interesting uh, trend, this interesting uh, diagonal uh, feature on this uh, size mass relation and uh, we seem to be reproducing this so you see this uh, diagonal feature also in our simulations. Now an interesting point um, or curious, uh, I hope maybe someone can help you understand what's going on here is the evolution of the uh, specific star formation rate. So for various masses shown in different colors this is the specific star formation rate as a function of redshift. Uh, so the, all the points here are compiled by Beruzzi from observations and these colored lines are for the different uh, stellar mass uh, beams from our simulation. So I think, uh, I mean, a few years ago with, uh, people thought that there is some plateau above redshift 2. I think it's not necessarily there and I would say, I mean, there are error, within the error bars, I think this doesn't look too bad. Um, what's interesting is that the black lines here show the dark matter specific accretion rate and you can see it has exactly the same shape as what we get for our simulations uh, for, this, for the specific star formation rate of the galaxies. Now you could interpret this as, an, as roughly a factor of two vertical offset but you can understand this in a different way as well. You can also move this, uh, these curves for the dark matter uh, horizontally to the left by just applying a delay of the current of the close to the current Hubble time at each redshift. 
and this gives you the, this uh, dashed black line, which is right on top of the on, of the stellar mass, uh, specific star formation rates that we get for the galaxies. So I don't know how to explain. I mean, this presumably you can say that there is some delay between the time when the gas enters the halo uh, until it reaches the galaxies. That possibly can explain this. Um, I'm not sure. What's, what also I found interesting is that um, this is not a generic uh, feature. Um, just of structure formation because in the simulation with simulations without feedback, this is the evolution of the specific star formation rate we get. It has a different shape than that of the dark matter or that we get with feedback. So I wonder if the, the feedback, um, so there is some conspiracy, I don't know how it comes about, that with the feedback we get uh, uh, for the specific star formation rate the same shape that we have for the specific dark matter accretion rate. So I'll be happy to talk about this with anyone if you if, uh, have ideas. Um, another nice feature of the simulations uh, we have is that we um, have galaxy bimodality. So uh, this shows the stellar, uh, the stellar image of our most massive uh, halo, 2 times 10 to the 14 solar mass halos. Halo. So you see the stars, uh, these galaxies are red and dead. On the other hand, uh, in uh, 10 Milky Way-like halos, we get uh, very nice disks. These are Specifically, even higher resolution than what we have than what we have in the in the cosmological box. These are zoom-in simulations with the same physical model by uh, Marinacci from Folkers Group, but we get these kind of very nice disks also in, in our in our box. So I'd like to look a little bit into this uh, galaxy by modality. So this is the star formation main sequence, star formation rate versus uh, stellar mass, and this is the black line here shows where most galaxies are. Uh, the, along the main sequence. And the colors in these two panels uh, show different things. Here the colors are by uh, circularity or ro rotation support of the stars. So we see, interestingly, similar to what's been shown in, uh, uh, in observations, along the main sequence, galaxies are rotationally supported. This is the blue, the blue color here. Above and below the main sequence, galaxies tend to be, uh, or the stars in the galaxies tend to be dispersion. Uh, uh, supported. The color here shows the uh, satellite fraction. So we see along the main sequence, galaxies are centrals. Also, the most massive galaxies are centrals, but they're uh, for low mass galaxies uh, below the main sequence, uh, they tend to be satellite galaxies. So we have several regions here. Along the main sequence, we have these disky blue here, blue here, uh, central galaxies. Here we have the massive quenched. You see the low star formation rate, circular uh, galaxies, they're, they're blue here. Uh, sorry, the red on this um, here. And then we have the, the, the spheroidal or the, the, the non-circular quenched galaxies which are not as massive and these tend to be satellites. So there is something in the, that makes the galaxies circular once they become satellite. Or, and uh, then above the main sequence we have uh, also uh, non-rotation supported uh, galaxies which are still, but there are centrals. Is Sorry? The, yeah, um, well the bimodality you can see it in, in, the, in the massive end. So I mean bimodality you can see in uh, colors or um, color magnitude diagram which I cannot show you yet. but. Yeah, well, you, what you see, basically the bimodality you can see it here is this, the main sequence and then the quenched galaxies. But this is not the best way to see bimodality. We have color magnitude diagrams which, all, which show uh, clear bimodality. Um, just like to uh, focus a little bit on this region and try to understand why is it that those massive galaxies are both quenched, they're low on the y-axis here, and they, they are circular. So what is, is it the same process that makes them, uh, uh, that quenches them and makes them circular? So there are a few quantities show, shown here as a function of time for one of these galaxies, and this is a typical example. Um, what's shown here uh, on top is the distance to the uh, similar mass companion. So what we see here when the distance is small is that this is the time of a merger. During this time, the circularity shown in green here drops from, this is a uh, disk dominated galaxy to a spheroidal. So the circularity drops during the merger. And then the uh, star formation rate, specific star formation rate show, shown in blue also drops during this merger and never comes, never really comes back. And then we also see the black hole activity. So to understand 
get a better feeling for how this works. You can uh, see this movie. This is the stellar light of one of these galaxies uh, that will end up elliptical and quench and redshift zero. And this is gas temperature. So uh, we see the disky progenitors of this galaxy. And uh, there's quite a magnificent uh, merger, uh, which is about to happen. You can see the AGN feedback uh, blowing uh, very hot temperatures. So we have this merger um, occurring here. No more disk. This is exactly the time when the circularity is destroyed. Now we have a, uh, an ellipsoidal galaxy, which is still star forming though. But then later, the quasar mode of the AGN blows out all of the gas and uh, leaves this galaxy, galaxy quenched. So and indeed, we have some examples, not many, of galaxies which are quenched but disky at this massive end. And the, the star formation rate in the black hole accretion uh, activity looks the same, but the, the circularity does not drop simply because there is no merger. So why is it that there's such a, a sharp uh, turnover here to these quenched elliptical galaxies? I think this is related to the merger rate. This is the, from Field's paper, the merger rate is a function of cell mass. It's very sharp, so for at there is basically a, a transition here that most galaxies undergo mergers, which destroys their, uh, which makes them elli elliptical, but all galaxies are quenched at these masses by the uh, black hole. So I'll leave, uh, I'll leave the summer here. And thanks. You mentioned you follow nine different elements. Do you have any results on the abundance ratios of galaxies? We haven't looked at that yet. Um, so I just have a question about, um, so those rotationally supported uh, dead galaxies, where would they show up on the uh, black hole uh, simulation? Uh, it's a good question. Yeah, um, I'm not sure. So. Uh, I mean, what quenches those, those galaxies is still a massive black hole, but uh, yeah. yeah, but uh, yeah, I, we haven't quantified that. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, one question. Uh, can you imagine saying the outflow of wind uh, uh, the, the wind rate, the mass loss rate in your simulation, especially for the galaxies, mm -hmm. uh, or other, you know, other uh, or probably also measure the, the loading factor, how big are Right, so uh, this is actually an input to the simulation. So we prescribe the, so for the, not for the AGN activity, but for the star formation, uh, we inject a constant uh, amount of energy per unit star formation, and we scale the wind velocity and the corresponding, and correspondingly the, the loading factor with, the will, with basically the depth of the potential well. So this is actually an input to the simulation. Uh, of course, now, I mean, we can we can measure this. It's slightly um, slightly further away from the galaxy, where also hydrodynamical interactions already takes pl take place and measure, for example, how much mass escapes the halo as a result of these winds. But directly from the galaxy, this is not something we uh, yeah we should measure, or um, this is something that we actually put in. Well, it depends on galaxy mass. So for Milky Way uh, galaxy, it would be uh, a few. A few, yeah. And lower mass, uh, for lower masses have higher mass loading factors because uh, we, we, ha we use smaller uh, wind velocities and we keep the energy per unit star formation constant. Quick question for Natalie. Um, yeah, I'm not. Re I'm not really sure. I mean, the, the, so you cannot see the density of galaxies on this plot. This is the, they're just colored by the average circularity in each in each bin here. Mm -hmm. I cannot tell you that number yet. Yeah. Yeah, um, I just don't have that number right now. Um, well, yeah, the thing is, again, I mean, there are galaxies that are just put on these beans, and then in each bean, I show the, the circularity. But I don't, I don't know how many galaxies are here compared to here. Yeah. 
Wait, I think you should show Anatolia CMD later. Yeah. Last question from Jay. So going back to Mark's and comment earlier about supernovae, my understanding is you have very high efficiency, 300% efficiency for supernovae, and that's being good to win, and then it's got micro. So essentially that's massively efficient. Yeah. The concern is that there's no difficult process to be efficient. What does that tell us about you know, what we're trying to do to make that up? Yeah, I think it's worrying. Um, we use a lot of energy. Um, of course, yeah, so we, we don't... Re you can also claim that we, we model this in the most efficient way uh, you can do and still... still I guess we probably get the, the, the low mass end probably around, around right. Um, yeah, I think it's to within uncertainties. So, yeah, I'm not sure. I think this is uh, something we should all uh, worry about.